Uh, we continue with Sang Yu Lee. Uh, Sang Yu uh, worked uh, the past month uh, for Punch Powertrain here uh, in Eindhoven on the development of a simulation environment for a hybrid dual clutch transmission system. And let's see what they say about you. Hmm. A true doer, always eager to help and go the extra mile. Polite, hard worker and smart. Very good technical skills and easily lives up to tremendous amounts of responsibility. Uh, he is disciplined, organized and a hardworking person. Has vision and always looks at the bigger picture. Strong commitment to achieve goals and match expectations. The quiet force. <laughs> Thank you, the floor is yours. First, thank you, my colleagues, for your kind words, and also thank you, Peter, for, for the introduction. And uh, my name is Zheng Yu Li, and uh, now I will present you my final PDN thesis. And the title of my project is The Development of a Simulation Environment for a Hybrid Dual Clutch Transmission System. And this project was performed at Punch Power Train in Eindhoven, and uh, with the supervisor from Punch side is Mr. Kung Van Diepen and Mr. Emilio Maldonado. And uh, from the university side is Dr. Theo Hoffman. So today I will going to talk about the context of my project, the approach that I took to tackle the problem, starting from the problem analysis, the system design and the results. And finally, a conclusion will be given. So let's start with a bit of the background of uh, the project. So as I mentioned before, this project was performed at Punch Power Train, and Punch Power Train is an international company that provides the innovative vehicle powertrain solutions. So as an international company, uh, the headquarter of Punch Power Train is located in Centoidum, Belgium, and also it has two research and development center in Eindhoven and another one in Germany. And uh, in addition to the Headquarter is also has two production sites, one in Nanjing, China, and another one in Iran. Also, it has two sales offices, one in India and one in Malaysia. So uh, its product line includes the CVT, which means the continuous variable transmission, and the DCT for the dual clutch transmission. And now they are work also working on the hybrid and the electric drive concepts. So my project is focused on the, this DCT transmission system. So the product of Punch of Our Trains dual clutch transmission system with code name DT1. Compared to its main competitors, the major benefits of this transmission is its compact design, then therefore reduced cost and this favorable fuel consumption. And with the success of this transmission system, Punch Power Train would like to even further extend their production line by developing hybrid variants based on this transmission system. So, and we also we all know the simulation plays a very important role in uh, system design process. And this brings me to the objective of, of my project. It is to develop a simulation environment that can be used to simulate the hybrid version of this punch powertrain DT1 transmission system. And the motivation behind it, it this simulation environment will be used in first support the product architecture choices and to generate functional performance requirements for its sub-modules and sub-components and also to analyze and validate some existing requirements within Punch Power Train. And uh, with this uh, objective in mind, then I have, there are two major milestones that I need to take into consideration while I'm planning my project. It is the first one in the middle of April, which is just in the middle of my project. And at this point, Punch Power Train would like to evaluate the requirements related to the hill launch scenarios. And another one is in November, which will be right after this project. It is to evaluate the requirements related to the hybrid functions. So based on these two major milestones, I have defined or planned my project in such a way, including two preliminary stage, two stages, and uh, they are separated by this middle of, uh, middle of April, the, uh, the milestone. So in the first one, the preliminary stage, a preliminary simulation model will be developed, 
and it will be used in, an, in the analysis and the validation of these hill launch scenarios related requirements. Another one in the in-depth stage, an in-depth simulation environment will be developed and it will be used to devise and simulate the high-level hybrid control strategies related requirements. And due to time limitation and confidentiality issues, I, I will only focus on the preliminary stage of how we uh, validate the hill launch scenarios. So now the question is, what is the, actually a hill launch and why are we so interested in these hill launch scenarios? So the hill launch scenarios here is defined as the vehicle will launch from standing still on the slope. So it will just drive like this. But what happens in the meantime in the vehicle powertrain system, uh, for a simplified version, it is so the engine will provide the rotational power and torque to drive the input shaft, and the input sh go, and it will go through this clutch by through slipping to drive the uh, the later the, this this shaft, and the power and torque will be further transferred to the wheels in order to actuate this hill launch. However, but during this process, because this two speed needs to synchronize, then during this process, this called clutch slipping, and it's mainly caused by the friction because the input shaft will uh, throw, throw friction to drive to bring this later shaft up to speed. But because it is friction, so this, there are a lot of energies will be generated and dissipated at this point. But if the temperature gets too high, and if we have performed too many repetitions of this performance, and or if the cooling capacity is not simply enough, then the temperature will get really high. And for that case, there's a chance that the uh, gear box will switch on its thermal protection status, which will limit the power that can be transferred to the wheels. Then in this case, then there might be not be enough uh, power anymore for the vehicle to take off. And this is, believe me, is not the ideal situation that the driver or the rear vehicle want to be in. So in this case, then we really want to know the clutch thermal capacity of our design. So for the hill launch, in total, we have designed seven hill launch test scenarios, also with different vehicle configuration parameters, including the vehicle weight, the engine selection, the gear selection, the gear ratio selection, and the road slope. So the target here, then this is clear, that we want to simulate the clutch thermal capacity. <coughs> And based on this, then the evaluation criteria of this simulation model is defined by punch power train, given in four categories. So functionality-wise, this model should simulate this hill launch scenario. And in the level of details, it should simulate the temperatures of the components in this DT1 transmission system. And accuracy-wise, the output uh, results will be compared with an already existing simulation model, and the error should be within the 5% margin of error. And runtime-wise, it should be 25% of the existing simulation model. Because the existing simulation model is built in a very complex way, and it is very computational heavy, so punch power train would like to uh, reduce the runtime of this simulation model. So, and uh, this is the structure of the model that I have developed. So in the middle, it is represented by the yellow boxes as a model of representing the physical components of the drivetrain of the vehicle. So starting from the engine, it is connected to the gearbox, connected to the brakes, to the wheels, and to the vehicle body. And the blue boxes here indicate the control-related components. So starting from the hill launch scenarios that we have defined, they will be translated into empirical control targets and then further be given to the engine controller and the gearbox controller, and together they will actuate this hill launch. And the external conditions, such as the road slope and the wind speed and the ambient temperature, will also influence the, uh, the performance of the vehicle. And finally, the measurements taken from the engine and from the gearbox will be fed to this purple box to compute the actual temperature of the corresponding component in the uh, transmission system. So after this model was built, then the first thing that we need to do is to do the validation. So therefore, I have uh, checked four outputs that come from this model and compared it to the existing simulation environment. And, and remember that, uh, that we have this 5% rule that we need to 
be uh, to satisfy. And the average error of, of all of these four uh, simulation outputs are within this 5% margin of error. And on the runtime wise, in order to execute a 1500 seconds hill launch scenario, it only takes about three minutes, which is only about 5% of the existing simulation environment. So here we conclude this simulation model validation is accepted and can be further used in the actual hill launch simulations. So as a small summary of this period, so functionality-wise, it is possible to simulate your lunch. And level of details, it is sufficient to simulate the temperature. Accuracy-wise, all simulated outputs are within 5% margin of error. And runtime, it is far below the 25% of requirements. So, and finally, we can apply this model on the predefined seven, te seven uh, tail launch testing scenarios, and the results are presented in this table in a color coded way. Here, the green one means that all the simulated results, results and the system parameters are uh, acceptable, and the yellow ones means they should be concerned and to be further taken into consideration in the future development, and the red ones means it is critical and it is not acceptable and this design must be changed. And this result has also been provided to Punch for Train to aid their development process. So here we conclude this preliminary stage. So for a small summary, of the preliminary stage, a use case study has been performed, a preliminary simulation model has been created, and the hill launch related requirements are evaluated. So this concludes my presentation, and I would like to say thank you very much, and uh, is there any questions? Any questions? Yes. And now we run for the mic. Hi. Hi. Which software you have used for your simulation? Uh, MATLAB and Simulink. Oh, okay, thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, thank yes. you for the presentation. Uh, I would like to know if you're calculating the surface temperature of the clutch interface or the core temperature of the clutch disks. Both. And uh, what um, equation or what model Temperature model are you using for that? Uh, I don't think I can talk about it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> More questions? There. There is a risk, I know the answer. Can you go back to slide 14? Yes. yes. Of course, in a simulation environment, you can do everything. But yes. the very key in this, for a real case, is, of course, the external conditions. Yes. Now, the set of external conditions. Yes. What, what kinds of sensors are you using, are you in, in real conditions using? Oh, that one, to be honest, I'm not aware of it, and because this, I'm not involved in the actual design process, so I will only evaluate the existing uh, data, so I assume this data is already available. So I'm not very familiar with the sensors that they are using right now. But you can imagine, say, yeah. you need somehow info on the hill uh, conditions. Uh, yes, the, the hill sensors, for instance. That's yeah. sort of the answer is what I expected. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? If not, let's thank, thank you again. Thank you. Andreas Krivas. Andreas, that is a project for Vibe, in fact, a little bit connected to NXP, as a supervisor is working uh, at NXP, uh, on cloud-connected vehicles. That's a totally different subject that uh, is also very important. Uh, Andreas, what do your friends say about you? Andreas has a great vision and is always future-focused. His motivation to change things for the better make him passionate. 
He's not just a player, uh, but also a game changer. Visionary, meticulous, and organized. Very good technical skills, system level thinking. His broad horizon gives him an edge in being innovative and systematic while solving difficult problems. Well, this was a difficult problem, so show us. Thank you all. Well, first of all, thank you for these kind of words. And thank you, Peter, for the introduction. So, uh, my name is Andreas Krivas. Um, very happy to be able to present what I found out uh, regarding the topic that Peter mentioned, regarding cloud connected vehicles. Uh, the subtitle, which is uh, Towards New Business Opportunities, is uh, to me the key. Uh, there's the key word there, the word business. It's a, it, could, it was a different project than the rest. Uh, I really was handed the problem that didn't have a form in the beginning, and I was tasked to really formulate it, but also find a solution. But let's get directly into the context. I believe that uh, almost everyone has heard this uh, buzzword, the word Internet of Things. Um, it's basically, just to give a very simple and short definition, uh, it's, it's the presence of connectivity in devices that were previously unconnected. Uh, for example, our cars, our uh, watches, or even our refrigerators. You can imagine that the presence of such connectivity functionalities influences all many industries today. And this is a very interesting graph. Uh, most companies pre uh, predict that by the year 2020, there will be more than 25 billion devices connected to the internet, generating trillions of data and, of course, trillions of revenue streams. One can really understand the impact uh, that these technologies might have in our daily lives, but also in our business. So, what I'm focusing on uh, regarding uh, Internet of Things, there are three main uh, topics. The first one is how Internet of Things is changing mobility, uh, as we call it, smart mobility. Uh, basically, the presence of uh, applications or services that uh, enable new modes of transportation, making efficient use of traffic management. The second one is connected car technologies. Uh, this is when we address the car from a technology perspective. It's the presence of devices inside the car that enable the car to connect with the outside world. We already heard from various presentations the terms uh, vehicle to infrastructure, for example, or vehicle to vehicle. And all these are realized by using cloud computing technologies. Cloud, very abstract word. We've heard a lot of funny definitions about cloud. Uh, if I could give a very simple one so that uh, you know already what to expect, cloud computing is the new way of uh, information technology. It's basically when uh, a supplier provisions uh, a customer with all the infrastructure that he or she needs in order to create new solutions or new applications. So everything is, uh, let's say, rented on a monthly subscription basis from the database somewhere in the world, and the customer doesn't need to build the infrastructure from the beginning. That's the main benefit of cloud. Now, all these three main domains are explored towards enabling entrepreneurship in Brabant, in Brabant here, in Eindhoven. We really want to see in this project how we can uh, exploit these technologies in order to create more business opportunities, create more job openings, and really uh, well, innovate more. Vibe has been active in this domain for the past four to five years. Uh, they were fun funded, uh, funded by four major organizations. You can see them there. NXP and TUE uh, were the biggest ones uh, back then. And their main goals involve, well, like I said, participating in enabling business uh, in Eindhoven. Uh, and their main project uh, was to create uh, an application programming interface. I know it's a complicated word. Basically, a set of guidelines, uh, an open uh, set of guidelines that enable the card to connect with the internet. And uh, the purpose was just to share with uh, the customers or with people that they wanted to use it in an open way. And their main goal at the end, the long-term goal, was to create an international living club where companies and people can innovate using open interfaces and open architectures. So we can say that really Vibe has been involved in all three layers that are involved in a connected car, from uh, providing a fleet of electric connected cars to uh, the interface and even uh, smart applications. What Vibe asked me uh, was two main things. Uh, the first was to create a recommendation uh, that was addressing uh, Vibe. 
um, on how should Vibe, but also in extension the region of Eindhoven, approach these technologies and how should they exploit them in order to create uh, new business opportunities. And the second one is to create a working proof of concept uh, to really demonstrate what I'm basically proposing in the recommendation, which makes sense. So, first, a few things about the recommendation. Uh, here in this slide, you can see the contents of that document. I will not address uh, each one of uh, these contents individually. Uh, I will mainly say how I was, uh, well, how I moved uh, into creating this document. I investigate. I interviewed a lot of people from the, inter uh, from the industry here in Eindhoven. I uh, followed a lot of uh, related events, uh, also in the region, but also globally. And then, uh, through uh, many iterations, I was able to uh, propose an alternative vision uh, for Vibe, but also for the region, uh, on how to proceed further. And then, strategic steps and tactical plans were formed. Now, I will mention only the key issues that I find that I found in the last ten months. Uh, you can see them here. Uh, I will summarize them. The main problem is, uh, which I also believe exists in other uh, countries, is that people do not really understand what is the impact of these technologies, how, how, what is the implications uh, by using these technologies in their uh, business or their daily life. That, of course, results in a lack of a common vision, because everyone has their own idea, but there is no clear uh, roadmap or a clear vision of how this would look like in 15 years, for example. And inevitably, then, we have an absence of le leadership because there is no one, like for example was Philips uh, several decades ago here in Eindhoven, that can lead the region to this new smart uh, era. era. <laughs> and uh, then, of course, entrepreneurship is lacking behind because uh, companies are less eager to invest uh, in something that they don't really understand. And inev inevitably we end up with solutions and a closed mentality trying, where companies trying to protect their intellectual property and uh, well, their solution from others and being the most profitable, uh, most profitable or the best in the market. Now, a possible solution to that or an alternative solution to that would be to establish an environment, a development environment, in an open way where more companies can uh, participate in creating new application solutions in an open way. And that means uh, even other companies can reuse these components and create even more innovative applications. So in this way, uh, numerous showcases in very fast and in an open way can be created. And that was the main driver behind uh, the birth of the concept that I was working on in this uh, project, which was a smart mobility platform, so a development environment for mobility applications, uh, that is based on four main uh, pillars. The first one is open development, of course, like I mentioned before, really using open APIs and interfaces. Uh, the multi-vendor functionality, meaning that uh, <coughs> companies, but also individual engineers and even universities, will be invited to create their own applications and also reuse applications from others. Uh, vendor infrastructure independence, uh, that I will explain meaning that the underlying infrastructure, uh, so not only the application, but also what we have that supports this application, should be standardized and used by everyone. And we should not be dependent on a specific supplier uh, to provide this infrastructure. And finally, and most importantly, the ease of development and deployment of new applications. So how easy it will be, or how seamless it will be, to create applications in a matter of few days, and in that way, really create very fast a lot of uh, showcases. And that, uh, one can understand, that has uh, benefits for, many, uh, for everyone involved. For, for example, companies in the region can really create new applications or even migrate existing ones uh, in that platform. A university can create student competitions in the form of hackathons, for example, uh, to really try to understand what, how these applications are made and what's their impact. And finally, the region of Eindhoven, the authorities here, will have a lot of showcases to really demonstrate to their people, to the citizens, how these technologies will change their lives. Now, I pro uh, yeah, I told in the beginning that I will uh, speak about cloud, and this is it. Uh, so I mentioned that I will be using cloud. In cloud, there are six main uh, models. Uh, you can see them here. So that can be categorized in two different categories. I will try to keep this as uh, less technical as possible. The first category is the deployment models, and basically is where are the resources that are, that are uh, provided by the cloud supplier to the customer. Are they in the data center of the supplier, or they're uh, being made uh, in the on-premise of the customer? 
Uh, and the second one, uh, the second category is the service models, uh, which basically explains what are these resources, uh, what is being provisioned and what is being sold to the uh, customer. For our case, I will just mention that uh, we were opting for public cloud, meaning that all the infrastructure services, all the infrastructure, all the resources will be uh, on a monthly su subscription basis on a data center of the client. That gives you a lot of flexibility because you don't need to invest uh, in the beginning uh, time and effort and money in order to create a very rigid infrastructure that you don't really know how it will evolve. And also you can stop or continue it in a very, open, a very flexible way. And regarding the service models, uh, we were opting for the infrastructure as a service, which means that the pl cloud provider will provide only the physical resources, so uh, servers, uh, storage, uh, virtual networks, um, uh, virtualization, these kind of things, and then the customer is responsible for creating the desired development environment, so operating systems or uh, well, uh, SDKs or SDEs. However, there are a lot more options that uh, need to be uh, were investigated in this project. One important, uh, one important one is uh, investigation of the uh, cloud providers that are interesting to base the platform on. And the four major, one were, uh, major ones were investigated, and uh, for several reasons, we were, uh, I approached Microsoft uh, to use their Microsoft Azure cloud services. And finally, uh, well, a lot of other services, such as the API from Vibe, or even an interesting cloud technology, which is Docker, and uh, can provide the infrastructure, the independence from the infrastructure that I mentioned before, were also included in the design. I will just mention the approach uh, and what happened, because I think it's a very, it was a very interesting process. First, uh, yeah, the requirements of the platform from business perspective first, and then from system perspective were defined. Uh, afterwards, I did the previous investigation that I uh, showed, and then I approached uh, several companies in order to see if we can have a first version of the platform by the end of this project, so by November. Uh, you can see them here, and also we have uh, the CEO of one of them in the audience. Um, and yeah, then in this uh, process, we try to uh, see if we can have this platform or which companies can provide some components or even already developed platform in order to have the platform by November. Uh, however, uh, after a while, we, had just, we realized that it would not be feasible in the project time frame to have such a platform ready in two or three months. So on parallel, while we were trying to uh, set up the platform for the university uh, afterwards, I was working on a prototype, uh, so a, a proof of concept that really demonstrates uh, the value of the system and tries to satisfy a subset of the requirements. So the requirements for the prototype and the specifications, so how I will uh, implement it, were created. And then I did the similar process on how to implement that prototype uh, in university. And that is where I approached uh, Microsoft. And uh, together with them, uh, with uh, their help, I created this prototype for the university. Additionally, I created an application, a smart mobility application, which was used to verify some of the requirements that I defined before. So to really say that it works or it doesn't work. And finally, with this application, uh, some of the requirements uh, in, eventually were uh, evaluated. So summarizing the results, the one part, of course, and a very important part is the recommendation to Vibe. And I think it needs to be mentioned that depending, uh, well, there will be a discussion in Vibe in the steering group uh, meeting, um, but they will discuss the recommendation. They will decide if they will continue Vibe or if they will stop it or if they will adjust their uh, goals. So it's uh, quite an important step. And regarding the mobility platform, the concept that was created in this project, uh, the one uh, road, uh, well, one path was the initiation of the platform. And there are already uh, on the table partnerships that if the university also wants can be realized in the next month with Microsoft mainly in order to have a more uh, complete platform uh, very soon. And on a parallel, a prototype and an application uh, were created and implemented, uh, evaluating some of the requirements. So what was achieved? Uh, yeah, the first, of course, is uh, I investigated a lot of options regarding a cloud-connected platform for mobile applications. So a lot of design choices are there, and the reasoning why some of them work and some of them do not. 
Uh, also, um, well, the concept of a new mobility platform was created, and I think this is something that's uh, quite new. There hasn't been in another university at this moment. Uh, also, we did serious efforts to have a real platform uh, by the end uh, of this uh, PDN assignment. And finally, of course, the working prototype of the platform and the develop application. But uh, yeah, for me, there are also some very other interesting achievements uh, which I experienced through the whole project is that really uh, I saw um, people starting to think differently, uh, especially when it comes to moving from closed uh, system mentality to opening up a bit, even if it's just a bit in the beginning, and I consider that to be an achievement. Also, I really think we discussed a lot in this project on how, is, uh, how you compare business with entrepreneurship, which to me is two different things. And finally, uh, by also trying to change things also in the university here, um, I, I hope that I helped a bit to challenge some uh, very stationary things that uh, uh, yeah, I believe should be changed in the future. But yeah, it was an interesting uh, uh, project. Well, we had the same picture in your presentation, it was not intentional. <laughs> uh, this one of Martin Steinbeck's favorite picture, uh, it's iPad wheels. They, well, the idea is that some people believe that in the future our cars will be basically just our smartphones, but will have wheels. So uh, this is all I had to say. Thank you for the attention, and I'm open to any questions that uh, you might have. Any questions? <laughs> any questions? Yeah, you need a microphone for the... I'm curious uh, about what kind of uh, proof concept or application you developed. Yeah, uh, well, the intention was to create an application that is simple enough to be created in a few weeks, but also has a connection with uh, mobility. So my idea was to create an application that uh, requests the coordinates from cars and maps them on Google Maps. And I used the API from Vibe. Um, yeah, and I used this application just as a means to actually investigate more the platform. Uh, yeah, so that was the application of the great, the tracking application of cars. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Andreas, uh, it is to be expected that this is gonna be a huge market in the future. Yeah. So how dangerous or perspective is it that in a, at a certain moment the Ubers or Googles of this world will take over this market very quickly? Well, it is a, a real danger. They are already trying to do that. Uh, however, we have, there are two choices. We either can just sit and wait for that to happen or we can actually try to do something about it. And uh, in Vibe, uh, and also I agree with them, they believe in the second. So. It might end up like this, but that also, uh, to me, doesn't mean that we shouldn't, as a region, try to create something here that is in benefit for everyone involved, universities, uh, companies, but also uh, people. And if it comes that after five or 10 years, it's everyone has Google in their car, uh, that's OK. But uh, I think we should try, yeah. OK. No more questions? There. Thank you. I, I find it extremely interesting, and at the same time, uh, I, I'm probably old-fashioned uh, enough uh, uh, to feel a little bit uh, uneasy at this. I, I find the, the example of smartphones, the, the development of, 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 say, mobile phones in the last 20 years, a very interesting sort of uh, background example to think about. But interesting enough, of course, they all use the same um, uh, networks, or uh, but the smartphones are different. Mm -hmm. The smartphones, I mean, depending on how much <laughs> money you want to invest, uh, you you basically you buy your your own smartphone, which has its own structure, um, environment. Uh, say the whole hardware software environment at the smartphone itself is still completely isolated from from the rest mm -hmm. and this is of course also true i mean i know this figure already for a very long time but there is a layer mm -hmm. that is still very much connected to the hardware to the vehicle itself 
how do you think Definitely. about that? Because there are challenges, uh, I, I share that, there are challenges that are not probably yet well explored, market-wise thinking, etc. But at the same token, when I go to my smart vehicle, I'm still working at a specific vehicle with specific toolings and probably a bit away from the generic platform you talk about. Yeah, uh, well, the platform, uh, such a platform has the purpose to really uh, try to uh, enable people to understand what these applications can do and what this technology mean. Well, if that platform could be standardized or not, uh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, the idea is, however, that in the future, I don't know how many years, uh, stepping into a, a new car, uh, it will be a similar experience with the iPhone, with a, a smartphone. In meaning that there will be configuration, you will configure the car just like you configure the uh, smartphone. And this profile will be also in another car if you're going to use it, or in a uh, different car. So, yeah, standardizing the platform, I don't think is something that we were aiming for at the moment. Uh, because, yeah, uh, it also has to do with hardware, and especially the cars that this safety is the number one uh, uh, criterion to create that, uh, yeah, to create such uh, platforms. But um, what we try to do is uh, really try to make people to understand that the configurability will be very similar. Uh, to bring an example is that in today's cars, uh, you have most of the times integrated navigation systems. Uh, it's a Mercedes system or Audi system, but you don't have an option to use your Google, uh, Google Maps or another system. This will be different in the future. But yeah, if the platform is going to be standardized or not, this is not the uh, focus of the project. Yeah. Great presentation, Andreas. Uh, just one question from the software guy. Yeah, sure. Yeah, for them. Of course. I um, think that uh, one of the most uh, important things that you try to achieve with this uh, project is to change the mentality from the closed source platforms that we see today to an open platform. Mm -hmm. And uh, for this uh, for this specific project, I saw that you chose Microsoft Azure as a deployment uh, and I I I A A S. Yep. Um, suppose that uh, in the future, mm -hmm. Microsoft changes their plans yeah. or their policies or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, then let's suppose that Google, platform, uh, Google Cloud becomes the, uh, uh, the choice to go, let's yeah. say. Yeah. How feasible mm -hmm. and what kind of scalability issues and uh, migration issues do you foresee mm -hmm. in uh, the in the chance, yeah. let's say, that you have to do this migration? Thank you for the question. It was something that I wanted to mention, but I didn't have the time. <laughs> uh, one, of the main one of the important uh, uh, advantages of such uh, a platform is this word, Tucker. Uh, this technology is called container technology in cloud computing. And basically what it does is that it puts in a box, to put it simply, all the dependencies of an application or a solution, which means that you can port it from system to system or from cloud to cloud. So basically what I'm proposing here is start with Azure because it has better development environments and we can find help also from commerce in the region that are using it. But if there's a need to, choose, to switch, by using Docker from the beginning, then you can switch in one day or two. So this is another benefit uh, that we introduce also in the platform. Thank you. You do very well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's thank Andreas again. <clears throat> and we move on to Kai Zhang, or Joshua, as some people call him. Kajang has do, been doing his, uh, his project at uh, Bosch Transmission Technology in, uh, in Tilburg uh, on integrated energy and advanced thermal management system for hybrid electric vehicles. Um, what do your colleagues think about you? This is the unstoppable engineering machine. That's, uh, Kajang can carry out any 
any challenge he's up to. He's charismatic, inspired, a fine-tuned machine again. He can make the impossible possible. One of his top words is, it's doable. If somebody can best fit the word politeness, discipline, and commitment, that's Kai Chang. He will not stop until he explained everything in detail and is sure that you completely understood. So now we know what's gonna, what we can expect, right? <laughs> Kai Chang, the floor is yours. So thanks for Peter, and uh, thanks a lot for my ASD fellows. Um, I'm Tai Yang, so welcome. Today I would like to present you my final project entitled Integrated Energy and uh, Advanced Summer Management System for Hybrid Cars. Yeah, so first of all, I would like to thank everyone involved in this project, so all the feedback, suggestions, discussions, I definitely appreciate it. So I'll walk you through today's agenda. So first, we will see what's the goal, what's the motivation behind this project, so which is then followed by system design and also some results in terms of implementation. So during the past decades, we have witnessed environmental contamination. So we are faced with energy issues, we are lack of fossil fuels. Then this is where electrification comes into place. So presumably, if we are able to make electric cars of hybrid cars, we are able to achieve better fuel economy. So specifically, in this study, we focus on hybrid cars. So normally, when it comes to hybrid cars, so we have multiple power sources. So you see the, the engine and also the battery. So what we are doing here is that at each time step, we want to split the power between the battery and also the engine to maximize the fuel saving. So basically, we are dealing with chemical energy, mechanical energy, and the electric energy. And also, this is the most concern in the current literature and the industry. But then when you think about it, what's missing here is that, so what about thermal energy? So apparently, it is there, but it is somehow ignored. Therefore, we took this opportunity to incorporate this thermal domain into the energy management system to become an integrated system to improve fuel efficiency. So for the sake of confidentiality, I couldn't show you what exactly what I did, but I will present the main ingredients of the system in a simplified fashion. So here you see, yeah, this is the normal from the engine, the fuel pass, the mechanical pass. So basically you can use the engine to drive the wheels di directly or to charge the battery. So furthermore, you can also do is that you use the battery alone to power the electric machine to drive the wheels, or to assist, motor assist, the engine to power the wheels. So furthermore, you also can recuperate brake energy to get more extra power. And then the question is, uh, how can we decide at each time step the power split between these two power sources? So basically, this is all we want to do. So we have these two power sources, we have this in mind, we want to minimize the fuel consumption. We want to power the wheels, of course, we want to move. Yeah. And then we have to power the auxiliaries. So here I mean like uh, air conditioning or like uh, cabin heating, for instance. Then how can we do that? So suppose I want to travel from Eindhoven to Amsterdam. So basically it's like a uh, velocity profile. So I need like maybe two hours. So during highway situation, maybe the speed is like 80 kilometers per hour. What if I can find the optimal trajectory of the battery? So basically, this reflects the energy state of the battery 
then I know. So what's, what's the power delivered from the battery so that I can calculate? So what should be the power delivered from the engine? This is how we minimize the fuel consumption. But in addition to the energy management system, what about the thermal domain? So here I show you two examples. So the first one, let's think about the situation. is severe weather, it's extremely cold. Traditionally, yeah, of course, during cold weather, you can imagine you have to inject more fuel to power the wheels because of higher oil viscosity and also frictional losses. But how can we solve this problem is that what if I can start with electric vehicle mode, basically the zero emission, and simultaneously I gain waste heat from the electric devices like electric motor or power electronics. I can use this heat to heat up the engine. So basically, so when the engine is working, yeah, it's optimal operating temperature. So it's favorable. The second example is that, yeah, it's widely actually acknowledged that so the basically battery is also very sensitive to temperature, it's especially during cold weather. The electric range reduced dramatically, actually. But then what we can do is that, again, we can use these heat sources to heat up the battery at the beginning to improve the battery performance. <coughs> But then why is it so important to consider thermal energy? So if you see this equation here, so once we introduce this thermal domain, so basically the energy flow changes within the hybrid car. It works more or less like shuffling. So the optimization strategy has to find a new solution for this problem. And yeah, because it's confidential, so I delete the data here. So basically, we, we start to, do, to develop all the models that we need. So I show you an example, the mechanical model, and this is the thermal model. So for the electric machine, so basically, we have like torque and speed, and then we see the efficiency. And for the thermal model, so for example, the, the engine temperature, where you see the, the slope is zero, it means the engine is shut off, so electric driving. You can also observe that yeah, the slope is less than zero, so basically it's like power dissipation to the ambient. So, so now everything boils down to control of this energy flow to achieve better fuel economy, to minimize the fuel consumption. So based on this cost function, this mass fuel rate, we want to minimize this one and subject to all kinds of constraints. So for instance, the max power limit to make it more realistic, we want to find the optimal solution. So what's more, what we need? Yeah, because now you see, we have all the models, we have optimization strategy. What we need now is the driving cycle. So here I show you two examples. Yeah, European driving cycle and also worldwide Homolines, light duty cycles. So, so what you see here is, is your, it's like you drive a car, it's the speed, so versus time. So at each time step, for example, at least time step, so your vehicle velocity is somewhere 80 or 90, things like that. So because in the end, we want to quantify the fuel consumption. So these are representative because, so you see this one, yeah, it's quite mild, it's a bit short, like 20 minutes or so, but this one is quite long, yeah, and also it's quite aggressive, as you can see here. So to keep the final results, I'm biased to some extent. So here we have some results. So, so basically here, the colors represent different driving modes. So you have engine driving of electric driving, and then this represents the mode switch, yeah, among all these different modes. So I show you an example. So the conclusion is that our system is able to improve fuel efficiency remarkably. So we see here. So the baseline is that, let's say during this region, yeah, you, you can observe it's purely engine driving. So you consume basically a significant amount of fuel here. But uh, 
based on the optimization strategy, what we can do is that we have motor assist here. So basically, we use the, the battery energy to assist the engine so that we can save fuel here, you see? And uh, yeah, that said, yeah, we can exchange heat optimally. But of course, you have to pay for the technology yeah? Yeah, through heat exchangers. We also did some yeah, cost-benefit analysis. Yeah. But I couldn't show you the, yeah, the details. Yeah. yeah, to sum up, yeah, the system yeah, is successfully implemented and also is able to achieve efficiency significantly. Yeah, basically that's the end of my project. Thanks. Any questions? You're up. <laughs> Thank you for your work. Yeah. I was wondering, you know, the hybrid car. Yeah. You see how the ICE engine, you know, work for the brake fuel a specific, you know, consumption. Yeah. So how you make, you know, a balance between brake, a specific, you know, fuel consumption yeah. and a thermal one. Yeah. That's my question, thank you. Yeah, so, so basically, yeah, because this is more related to what exactly I did. Yeah, this is a bit uh, confidential, but I can explain a little bit. So what do you have? Let's say, for example, during cold weather, right? During cold weather, extremely cold. Yeah. So if you start with the engine, of course, you have to consume more fuel. So it will be favorable to use the heat energy from the electric motor to heat up the engine first. So basically, the automatic strategy decides. So at the beginning, OK, I can start with the EV mode because it's more favorable. I can gain extra heat. This is a waste heat. Huh? It's like a gain free energy. You can use this to heat up the engine first. So basically, by the time engine is working, it is optimal. So you don't need to inject more fuel, things like that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, two questions. The first one uh, will be related to the last uh, slide you show us, yeah. where you are deploying the battery on the, uh, the graph below. It says that um, the state of charge is the same. So how are you maintaining the charge while deployed in the battery? Mm -hmm. And uh, the other question will be related to, to the conditions that you used for, the, for, the, for your work. Mm -hmm. What will happen if you run the same project on high temperatures? So cold temperatures will be fine, but high temperatures will deplete your battery way faster. Yeah. yeah so the first one actually is uh, it's not a straight line. It's because of resolution and also the confidentiality. It's not a straight line. Yeah. It's a charge sustaining mode. Because, so we assume a charge sustaining mode here. So the battery is sustained within a certain range. So you have to use the engine to bring it up to the original state. So this is the standard way to assess the performance of the optimization strategy. So this is the first one. And regarding the second question, this is that, uh, so basically, so in the model I have, I'm able to simulate all kinds of different temperatures, actually. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I couldn't tell you the details about the, the efficiency models. Yeah. But of course, the temperature influences the, the behavior. But uh, this mainly relates to the control. So if the temperature is different, then the system somehow is like uh, can interpret the, the current situation and then makes a smart decision accordingly, since like this. So basically, everything boils down to this one. Yeah. You make the decision, yeah. No matter I'm in, in hot temperature or in winter temperature. Yeah, but of course, I couldn't show you how I exactly did it. Yeah. Thanks. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you can tell us what kind of optimization techniques that you used, even the titles? Yeah, it's, I think uh, it's not possible. It's not allowed, I think. <laughs> yeah. okay.
Thank yeah. you. Yeah, because this one is quite new. Yeah, it is quite new. Yeah, so I'm not allowed to say that. Uh, thank you for interesting work. Uh, yeah. My question is: uh, Have you considered uh, the efficiency maps for uh, electric er electrically dri driven uh, car and the internal combustion engine? Because you are using internal combustion en engine to charge the batteries. Yeah. Uh, have you considered in what speed condition and what traction condition which one is more efficient or not? Just yeah. for curious. Yeah, it's, it's included in the model. So basically all the efficiency models are in the, in the simulation environment. They are there, yeah. So, so basically the, the organization strategy already takes what you just said into consideration, yeah. So based on that, you can make a small decision. So what would be the optimal for this whole trip? So suppose I travel from Eindhoven to Amsterdam, so what would be the ideal situation? And also the battery is charge sustained. Because basically I don't know what's the next the, let's say plug in point that you can recharge your battery through the grid. Since then, like please. Yeah. Let's thank Kai Chang. Thank you. And we continue with Lazarus. Lazarus, this is the project with uh, Frank Willems here at the university, a uh, little bit in cooperation with TNO, on uh, systematic design of an intracycle fueling control system for advanced diesel combustion concepts. Difficult title, but he'll explain it undoubtedly. Uh, and your colleagues say about you that you're inquisitive and not afraid of challenges. An industrious person, and he acts proactive, proactively and is very involved in all his projects. Well-versed team player, capable of handling a variety of assignments. Organized, flexible, always pushing himself to the limit. Structured, and above all, a multi-machine. No matter what he is asked to do, he will deliver on time. Larry is an amazingly fast learner, a born project manager. Nice words. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Peter. Also, many thanks to my colleagues for your nice words. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lazar Kefalidis, and I will present you my graduation assignment for the ASD PDA project program. I will talk about the systematic design of an intracycle fueling control uh, system for, with focus on advanced diesel combustion concepts. The project uh, was uh, developed at the university and it was part of a greater project, a research project, the heat control project. It was steered by Professor Frank Willems, Dr. Bram de Jager, and our program manager, Peter Huberger. We heard a lot in also previous presentations about fuel efficiency, fuel consumption. Everyone is looking towards this direction, but I will present a systematic way of how we can actually in practice achieve that. So let me start briefly with the agenda of my presentation. I will start with a short introduction about the context, the context of the problem and also the concept. I will go in depth with the architecture of the in-cycle system. Then I will touch a bit the high level objectives of combustion control, in-cycle combustion control, and I will highlight the conclusions and the achievements of the project. Then you will have some time to address your questions. Well, as my title revealed, my project focuses on uh, advanced combustion concepts, and these concepts occur on uh, engines, diesel engines, and these engines are designed mainly in order to operate with uh, high performance, while at the same time keep the emissions as low as possible, reduce the engine noise, and also achieve minimal cost of ownership. These requirements are not perfect in line, and they are usually conflicting each other. A way to optimize them and achieve a better trade-off between them is by controlling the combustion itself. Combustion of the engines can last just a few milliseconds, and during this time frame, we have the possibility to inject our fuel 
and exploit its energy in order to power the engine. In order to optimize the combustion, we can manipulate this fuel injection system, and we can have the full control of how many times we want to inject, when, how much, and also at which pressure. And these are four very important parameters that we can manipulate in order to achieve better performance of the engine. What is our ultimate goal here? We can see in the middle of this figure that I have shown some advanced combustion concepts, and they are characterized by low emissions and low temperature of combustion. On the other hand, conventional diesel combustion is represented by the red line, and we can see that it passes from regions of, forma of soot formation and also other emissions that we want to avoid. Our goal, by controlling the fuel injection system, is to manipulate the parameters I presented before and move to the middle of this curve and achieve low emissions and also high efficiency. How the control of a fuel injection system is typically achieved? Basically, conventionally, by controlling a fuel injection system relies on some data that are already pre-calibrated and we rely on them in order to control our fueling based on pre-existing data and operating condition. We have the facilities in our university, in our lab here, and you can show a picture of our engine setup where we can apply closed-loop combustion control, that is a next step in the control of the engine and fueling systems, which enables us to take some feedback from the combustion, process it, and use it in order to uh, perform more accurate injection control. One concept of this that has already successfully been implemented was the next cycle combustion control, and this concept is described as we can schedule the injection commands of a combustion cycle, taking as a reference a decisions from a previous combustion cycle. My project is one step further, and this relies on real-time in-cycle combustion control. And I will explain the difference between this concept in my next slide. Here we can see the combustion cycle and the pressure that is derived through this operation. And the focus of my project is to understand how the combustion evolves, use relations between these conditions and the actions of the fueling system in order to achieve at the end better engine performance and track some reference points of heat release. As I said before, next cycle combustion control concept was already implemented. And providing some further details regarding this concept, let me introduce that in this concept, just from the beginning of this compression phase, we already have made any decisions regarding our fueling profile in the cycle. And this means that we have already know how much fuel we want to inject, when we want to inject, and how many times. No matter what, this cannot change. Any applicable change will go to the next combustion cycle. On the other hand, in the concept that I'm considering, the in-cycle combustion control, we have the full control of and the flexibility of manipulating real-time these commands. In other words, we start with a preliminary, preliminary first injection command, then we apply our controller, and we sense the combustion, we take data, we process, we perform control calculations, we schedule the next injection commands, we actuate the fuel injector, and then we perform the next injection event. How fast we can do that, how fast we want to do that, you can see that we want to achieve this in less than a millisecond. Is this fast? You can trust me that this is much, much, much faster than a blink of an eye. Based on the same strategy, we go for the rest injection pulses. So the focus in my project lies on designing a system with mainly focus on how to perform real-time control, communicate our injection commands, and actuate the fuel injector, meeting this requirement of timing. And let's see how we did. The starting point was our uh, existing system in our lab uh, facilities, where you can see the engine in the middle. And we have a pressure sensor. We take the data of the combustion. We put it in a control device where we make the processing calculations. We communicate the injection commands to the electronic control unit device. 
and this performs the injections. This was the existing system, and let's see if it was capable of performing the concept we want to achieve. We identified that this system has a delay inside that's around 11 milliseconds. What we wanted to achieve was less than one. Thus, we can conclude that the in-cycle control concept is not feasible. So, we had to come up with a new design, with a new system that can meet our timing requirements. After consultation with different suppliers and also with the involved stakeholders, we came up with a new design hardware. We built it, implemented it in our facilities, and we have tested it. And we introduced new hardware, also new software, and control algorithm that can perform really fast and enable controlling real-time our injection system. And this system is, besides real-time capable, also compatible with existing hardware because we have a lot of different components that have to cooperate in harmony. It's modular and can be expandable also to future applications that are involved in our research, research activities. Coming to the validation of such a system, because we had a very strict requirement of timing, we performed a test scenario with our engine here, where we scheduled just two injection events. We had our engine running. We made our uh, algorithm run in the control device. We had six controllers running in parallel, but their output was deactivated. And we measured a delay in our system up to the fuel injector around half millisecond. Then we have the remaining delay of the fuel injector itself that can be categorized to electrics, mechanics, and hydraulics. This remaining time is estimated from experimental data that we have in our combustion group, and it can be, it can be estimated around 0.15 to 0.20 milliseconds. In total, we can result to an estimated delay of the whole system around 0.65 to 0.70 milliseconds, and we can see that is it well within the initial margins? So, thumbs up. Now that we've identified and designed a system that is fully capable of performing the in-cycle control in terms of timing, we can go to the in-cycle combustion control itself. The purpose was to have the flexibility to perform multiple injection events, and I consider in just three here. So we have a first, a short one pilot, one second, that's called main, and the last one. And we want to apply our controller within two consecutive injection events. Our high level objective of the, the combustion control is to meet the engine performance requirements like power, fuel efficiency, combustion noise, and also emissions by keeping the reference of a released heat from the fuel. And available parameters in order to do that are parameters regarding the timing and also the duration of the injection pulses as we can see here. So we identified a good, see here we can see the heat release curve, that is the thick one, and this is what we are actually want to track because it's the heat that is released from the fuel and we use it in order to power the engine. And you can see three peaks that uh, they correspond to three injection events. And we had identified with our experiments a good correlation between the heat release at the point where the 5% of the fuel is burned with uh, the biggest injection, the one in the middle, and also we have identified a good correlation between the heat release at the point where 50% of the fuel is burned and the last injection event. So based on that, I will conclude with uh, our final in-cycle combustion control proposal that was to use the manipulate the duration of uh, the main injection, also the last injection event, based on the heat release at the identified points in order to meet requirements and uh, have more stable performance of torque efficiency, and combustion noise. This brings me to the conclusion of my project and uh, what was actually achieved. So regarding the in-cycle control itself, we identified that there is a variability at the performance of the system, of the engine, and we can reduce it by the in-cycle control. So we came up with a new control strategy that can be performed real time. So we did this part. And regarding the new design that we implemented and uh, built in our, in our lab, we successfully implemented new hardware design that is capable of enabling this real-time control. We implemented our real-time injection control on a rapid control device, and we demonstrated and val validated that the whole system is capable of working and it's very safe for the engine. So 
this brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for your attention, and now the floor is yours for some questions. Questions? Hi, uh, Hi. Thank you for your detailed presentation. Uh, I just have a question uh, regarding uh, as to why uh, correlation was observed between those two points exactly. Is it yeah. uh, related to some uh, linear non-linearity in the model or? Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, actually, the engine performance like torque, efficiency, combustion noise you cannot directly measure. So there is a correlation between uh, torque and the indicating mean effective pressure, so actually combustion parameters that you can see, measure, and process. And uh, we identified based on experiment that is, there is a linear correlation, because you can imagine that when you inject more fuel, then you have more power and you gain more torque at the output. When you manipulate, when to inject the fuel, then you can exploit the efficiency of the combustion. So it's in the nature of how combustion itself evolves. Of course, I have to ask a question. Um, slide nine, can you, can you go back to slide nine? Yeah, sure. Um, probably I'm confused about some, yes. uh, something. Um, because, I, I mean, it, it's a very interesting sort of idea. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a block here disabled, yes. which is interesting to me. But, uh, but sort of what I, my, my concern is basically um, the, the sensor and I mean, in the previous, I think one of the previous slides, you were more explicit on that. Yeah. The pressure sensor and the, the charge amplifier, how much time would, I mean, what is their processing time? Yeah, it's uh, almost instant because uh, the main latency is on the sampling rate of the amplifier that can be estimated to microseconds. So compared and to... And the pressure sensor? And the pressure sensor, we have not the exact data of how fast it can actuate, but it's analog signal and it's also very, very fast. But we measure from the point that uh, we take the measurement up to the end when we inject the fuel. So this is already estimated inside. So you're confident, if you go back now to your next slide, just, uh, you're confident because it's sort of the, the concern that I have mm -hmm. is you have to, on the one hand, you address the, the computational yes. side, so to say, you have the, the, the actuator. Exactly, uh, the fuel part. injector. Exactly. And so if I was missing the discussion on, on the sensing part, uh, time-wise, because you are really at a, at a very high speed uh, sort of uh, controlling the system. Yes, yes. You're confident that this yes. all, all works in that sense? Yes, because it's analog signal, it can be really fast. No more questions? Um, well, uh, you said um, like one millisecond reaction time, but what about the bandwidth of your system? Even though you are creating that much uh, uh, actuator reaction, but uh, do, does it mean also that you can obtain that uh, fast reaction from your system? Because it's, since it's a mechanical system, I don't think it has like no, uh, one kilohertz of bandwidth. Okay. What about the bandwidth of the, uh, your system? So for instance, uh, there is a delay in the control device at the speed goat, and this has uh, mechanical limits, as you said. But for instance, uh, we run at very, very high f speed, and we can uh, output a function in nanoseconds, because we are uh, designing on the FPGA, Part, so there are multiple blocks that they can perform simultaneously together and can be really fast. Oh, I mean the mechanical and actuator 
And yes, and regarding the other delays in the system, for instance, the fuel injector, yeah. yes. So we have confirmed by the supplier and also measured in experiments we have that from the time that the injection command arrives, by the time we can see actual fuel inside the chamber, the combustion chamber, is less than 0.2 millisecond. And this is a very, very high speed fuel injector. You can continue your discussion after, during lunch. Because People are it's time for lunch. We thank Larry again. Thank you.